to moving on, both amplitude and ring modulation featured in a lot of these earlier radiophonic studios, from the GRM studio in Paris to the Electronic Music Studio in Germany with Caroline Stockhausen. So in the frequency shifter, we can also have the option to ring modulate. And what ring modulation is, is the output of one oscillator multiplied with the signal of another source and the output is ring modulation. So it's often a mechanical kind of robotic kind of tone depending on the frequency that's been used. If it's in sub audio rates, it can sound something like tremolo. And at higher rates, the actual fundamental frequency of the instrument can be lost and what's produced is a result of the sidebands of the two frequencies. Another common modulation technique that they use was frequency modulation. And this is a long time before the introduction of frequency modulation since, such as Yamaha's DX7, where frequency modulation was a way of creating very complex sounds using a minimum of equipment. So how you simulate this in a modern DAW is generally within samplers. So I'll set up a sampler device on this track here, or within Logic, you can use the Ultra Beat drum machine to load your sounds in there and then apply LFO modulation up to 100 Hz to any of the sounds that you've assigned on the keys. So I've set up my sampler and the sound source is the howling wind underneath the door that we were listening to a minute ago. So I'll just play this back. And then within the sampler, if you go into the pitch and oscillator section, this section here is where we do frequency modulation. So if I turn it on, I can set the volume and I can set the frequency. So again, we can have it sub audio. Or oh, then we can go into the audio register. And this is what I was talking about, at the, about the efficiency of it. We're just using a single oscillator to modulate our audio content. And we can get a whole range of timbres as a result. So in the early days, frequency modulation wasn't really used for pitch material. It was more used for special effects and creating metallic and bell type timbres. So another effect that we use a lot today that was first developed in the Music Concrete Studios is comb filtering. You can achieve comb filtering by using two copies of the same sound and applying a very short delay to one of the channels. So I've got two channels here with exactly the same recording of white noise on it. So when I play it back, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce a slight delay to one of the channels. So start off with one millisecond. And now you can see how comb filtering actually gets its name in that a series of notches have appeared in the sound that resemble a hair comb. If I alter the track delay, it alters the position of where the notches occur. So by using this technique, you can affect various sections of your frequency spectrum and cancel out or emphasize certain areas. So as I'm increasing the track delay here, you can see the position changing, going down in the notches that have been created. Creating very strong coloration of the sound. So if I switch over to my other channel here, let's get rid of the spectrum analyzer for now. I've got three recordings that we we're listening to in some of the earlier videos. So on the first one here, I've got a recording of bells. So to get a copy of this signal, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send it over to a return channel here. So I'll turn up my auxiliary send. And now you can start to hear the comb filtering because on this channel over here, I have a simple delay set up and it's introducing a one millisecond delay. If I adjust this time, Creating different comb filtering settings and coloration of the sound. So some of the results that we're getting here are, would be similar to using a phaser or a flanger 
except we have no modulation of the time here, so we're not getting any dynamic changing of the filtering. So a chair banging. So by simply altering the delay time, we can get different kind of frequency response in the output. So we can get a lot more interesting results if we introduce feedback. So as you know, feedback is sending some of the output of a signal path back in to the input or somewhere along the chain. So when I start to turn up my feedback on the effect here, it will extend the resonances that have been created by the delay offset. And the pitch, the frequency of the result is controlled by the delay time. So by only adjusting the result by a millisecond or less, you can get a huge variation in the output. So again, a simple process, but very effective in getting various other timbres from an original sound source. Switch over to our bell sound. So because I've got this set up as a pre-fade sound, I can actually remove the original. So all we're getting now is the return. So obviously this can be performable. And we can also control this with some type of automation or modulation. With a bit of experimentation, because the delay time is altering the pitch, you can get musical effects that can be in key with the song that you're actually working on. Obviously, at a certain point, the filtering will turn in to actually echo or delay. Because originally, the type of circuit that they would have been using would have been analog. In an analog circuit, when you alter the delay time, you also affect the pitch of the sound. So if you're using something like a roll and tape echo, which is a modern version of a tape delay, by switching this over to repitch, I'll get something that simulates that. So when the delay time changes, you get kind of a pitch bend or wobble in the sound similar to very speed. But that's going slightly beyond comb filtering.